I wonder if we always realize just how beautiful this music is that my brother had composed for this church. I think perhaps a lot of the things in the early part of the church many of you don't realize, and perhaps have not heard or been informed on. But when we first began the college, and we were raising up a new church here in Pasadena, you know, a local church. And we already had a couple of churches up in Oregon. They were very small. And no real minister to take care of them at all. And my brother had composed a piece that I heard him play, and it was very beautiful. And I had had the idea ever since I had been converted that in the congregation we should be singing the words that God himself has given us. You know, the hymns that we had been singing were just regular hymnals that other churches use. And I noticed that they all seem to sing the praises of the people. And if you go, if you get some of those books and read the words that go with many of those hymns, composed by people having no knowledge of the Bible actually, they sing the praises of the people doing the singing. Whereas the Psalms that God wrote, and the Psalms really mean songs, sing the praises of God and are meant for the worship of God. And so I asked my brother if he would devote his time to composing hymns for the church. And so he devoted the rest of his life for it. Now I think there are about as many hymns that he composed that have not as yet been printed and that you have never heard as there are already in the book. And in due time, they will come along and we'll be learning new ones. However, we have a great many, even as it is. And hearing that number just played on with two violins and a piano made me realize when you hear it just for the music and play the special music, it is beautiful music. So I I will say that much in my brother's memory. He died at the age of 80, and he had devoted the rest of his life from back about 1947 to composing the music that we all sing. Well, brethren, this afternoon is the last service in the first annual festival of the year. We have festivals three times a year in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. And we have the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread in the spring, and this is the second holy day at this time. I want to tell you a little later how we come to be observing these days. But first, I want to just say, do we really understand why we keep them? And do we understand this particular festival of the Feast of Unleavened Bread fully? You know, we have an entirely different situation today than they did in the days of Jesus and the first original first century apostles. I think that we have heard compared a number of times and uh, some of the things that have been put on the motion picture screen for us of the comparison of what those apostles had to confront and how it is for 
the apostle today. And strangely, here's a much bigger world today, and many more people in the church than there were the first year or two in the church back there when they had 12 apostles. Of course, the number of apostles grew even then, but there were 12 at the beginning. And yet they had to go afoot or on horse or mule back or row a boat by hand or sometimes they could use a sailboat. At the whim of the winds. But today we have so many more people and just one apostle today can carry the message out to millions more people than those twelve could do in those days. Today we have automobiles, we have the airplane, And we have the printing press. And today, we are probably reaching somewhere around 20 to 25 million people through the printing press. And we are reaching, undoubtedly, much more than a million every week by television. How many people do you think who just happen to tune in and happen to listen to a program on television, and we're never on the best network stations or at the best time, how many out of a thousand or out of two or three thousand who listen do you think you're going to go to the trouble of going to the telephone and calling in to request literature? One or two out of a thousand, perhaps, or out of two thousand or three. And yet here we're getting up 10, 12, 14, 17,000 telephone calls from one program. And that is not even half of the number of people that are writing in to subscribe for the plain truth or for other literature. There are still more that come in from newsstands and from other means, and we are reaching people by the millions. But there's one other difference between the way conditions were at that time and the way they are today. This is the festival teaching us to come out of sin. By putting leaven out of our houses, it is the idea is to teach us to put sin out of our lives. Well, there are more sins that have been getting into lives today than there were in the days of the early apostles. I wonder if you realize that. Now, they had all of the natural sins that we still have today, but there are more mechanisms today that increase the amount of sins, more opportunities for sin. With a motion picture and the automobile and all of the things that we have today, and the printing press, Now, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days just before his second coming and his return to put an end to all of this kind of sin in this world and to bring in God's world, the world tomorrow, the kingdom of God. And certainly what he said was true. Sins have multiplied and increased, and there's so many more ways to sin. Now today, instead of coming out of sin in the world, it seems that the public media, not only newspapers and magazines, but radio, television, 
every means of reaching the people, are trying to show people how to sin and get away with it. In other words, how to avoid the penalty of sin, but not, not how to avoid the penalty by quitting sinning, by coming out of sin, but go ahead and sin, and then avoid the penalty. One of the greatest sins today, and it has been ever since, I think, the days of Adam and Eve, and one of the things that Satan is using against the world, perhaps even more than almost any other area of sin, is sex. I wonder if you ever stop to think Satan has no sex. He cannot reproduce himself. And we have been given such a wonderful, God-given opportunity to reproduce ourselves, to have a family relationship, a loving, pleasant, joyful family relationship. Satan and the angels cannot have that. Now, I think the angels rejoice. And their mission is to aid and service us who are the heirs of God's salvation and of his kingdom. And it is like the angels are a good deal like the nanny that, uh, uh, for example, the young, I think there are two young princes now in England, and uh, there was a new one born not long ago, but uh, the parents don't really take much care of them. They have a nanny to take care of the little kids. Or they have servants. Wealthy people have servants to look after the children. But when the child grows up, if he is the heir of a very wealthy father, then he will, of course, be in a much higher position than the servant. But while he's yet a child, the servant is over him. And so the angels are now higher than we are, and they're here to serve us. They're not only demons, and the demons are ruling this world because Satan is sitting on the throne of the world and not an angel. Satan is a former archangel, but he's sitting on the throne. But the holy angels are there to serve us. And I could tell you of a number of places, and as a matter of fact, I remember that I I wrote that and added it in the book that I've been telling you about that is now complete, and I think unless we discover something else later that we want to update or alter or uh, make an addition to or something, it's now complete and ready to send to the printers for final printing. And by the way, we are going to print the book in the Plain Truth serially. And uh, the first issue will come out in about another month or so. I've already turned the copy over to the uh, editors of the Plain Truth. And we, of course, we have the whole book ready by now. But we hope to have the whole book ready before the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's ready to go to press and just as fast as they can get it printed from now on. But, well, I was going to mention something a minute ago. I think it slipped me now that I added uh, into the book. Well, anyway, let me get along. I'm speaking without notes now, and I just have to say what comes to my mind. And it reminds me of the last two nights have been a a movie on Channel 13 about Golden Meir. I wonder if some of you saw that. It was two hours each evening. It was a full four-hour movie. It was probably about three hours or a little more originally, but the commercials take out so much time on television. So it took two nights for it. And it concluded with the time when 
and Warsadat made the famous visit to Jerusalem to declare peace instead of war. And it showed them having uh, some kind of a banquet. And uh, President Sadat had made a speech and others. And finally, Mrs. Mayer was going to have to make a speech. And someone sitting next to her said, well, have you thought about what you're going to say? Do, 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 do you have something in mind to say? What are you going to say? She turned and said, well, did you ever know me when I didn't have anything to say? I, I, I couldn't help think about myself. Maybe I don't have anything to say when I come out here, but I'll keep saying it. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I knew Golda Meir, and I knew Anwar Sadat. And Anwar Sadat was a very courageous man to have made that visit. And I attributed, so far as you can attribute to carnal people that are not, that do not go by God's Holy Spirit, I attributed greatness to her. She was a very unusual woman, and so far as the natural mind goes, she said some of the very things to me that were said on this movie toward the end. And she told, she said to me that she wished that the leaders of the Arab nations could all come and sit across the table from her. She said we could have peace. And she said our scientists and our technicians and our experts could teach them so many things to help them. And they could produce so much more out of their lands. And they could have so much more of the good things of the world. They could be happier and we could all be happier. Now, I have visited many heads of state, but I have never heard anyone else say that about enemies. That was one of the things that I noticed. Well, there's one thing. There are more sins and more opportunities to sin today. And the whole effort is to make sin possible and to then avoid the penalty. To try to cheat God out of the penalty. Now, the wages of sin, finally, is death. And all the scientists and technicians in the world are never going to cheat God out of that. However, most of them are asleep at the switch and they don't know what they're doing. Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And really, I think that far more than 99% of the people in the world just know not what they're doing when they're sinning. There's so little of the right kind of education in this world. And their minds have not been open to the truth of God. Satan has blinded them. And they are blind. But one of the things he is tempting people on almost more than any other one thing today is sex. Now they try to make it possible to enjoy illicit sex in a way that God never intended. And in so doing, they enjoy the beauty of sex as God intended in marriage. And then the production of children, lovely little children to come along, and the beautiful family relationship of real, genuine love. For a temporary sensation. So today, they're beginning to find that what they sow, they reap. Now we have the new diseases now. AIDS. Coming from homosexuality. So they try to justify homosexuality 
instead of trying to do away with it and teach it for what it is, they say, well, it's just his sexual preference. Well, indeed it is. And sin seems to be the preference of most people instead of righteousness. Do you ever think about what is your prefer- preference, brethren? Is it sin or is it righteousness? Because again, as I've mentioned before, let's see, was it in the sermon this morning or was it the sermon this morning? I mean, the sermon this after sermon, that this afternoon and the sermon this morning. And it was someone mentioned how I had said that sin is the absence of righteousness. That's precisely what it is. And righteousness brings so much peace and happiness and joy. And it is the absence of that which brings sorrow and suffering and pain and anguish, discouragement, frustration, remorse. And those consequences are not happy. They're not pleasant. And that's what the world is suffering. I think they say that, I heard a statement the other day, I don't remember the exact figure, but nobody who had AIDS a certain number of months ago or a couple of years or something like that or three is still alive today. They know of no cure. And yet they don't say, let's give up homosexuality and begin to obey God's laws. They say, no, let's break God's laws and let's try to find a way around it. And so the scientists now are trying desperately to find a killer for AIDS. Let people go ahead and break God's law. Let them bring on this disease. And then let us find some way to cheat God by a medicine that will cure it. And let me tell you, there is not a cure in a thousand carloads or a million freight carloads of medicines and drugs. There just isn't. It may be temporary relief, but you know, even the government won't let you put a cure in advertising any kind of medicine. You can say relief. You can't say cure. Then much in the news in the last couple of days has been another one that I frankly had not heard of, although I had written a textbook on the subject of sex. This is something that I think has come along since, and I had not heard of it. The... IUD. I had a hard time remembering that because they want to use initials today and they don't want to speak the whole words out. And I have to think it's I and you and then D. And a lot of women have been experimenting with that as a contraceptive. And they're finding that once she uses it now, in so many cases, it makes her barren. And some wives, in order to postpone another pregnancy for a year or two, have used this, and then they find they can never have another child when they want one. You can't cheat God's laws and get away with it, brethren. You cannot do it. I hope we have the sense to know that. The world does not have that kind of sense. They want to break God's laws and then use some means of a drug or a medicine or have science invent something that will let them sin and then avoid the penalty. They throw sex at you in every way today, on television. I think it was this morning there was a sermon. Yes, 
about turning on X-rated movies on television if you have the um, uh, or, or one of these uh, additions to your television set that you can get now so that you can have the rottenest kind of sex coming right into your living room. And a lot of people like to feast their eyes on something of that sort. Well, we were advised in the morning sermon against that sort of thing. Now, I thought it might be interesting this afternoon if you would know a little more about why you are here and how you came to know about these holy days. Here we are on a Friday. What are we doing here on a Friday anyway? The world will probably think we're crazy. I have explained some of this before, but I think I haven't explained what I'd like to say now in quite the same detail. I thought you might be interested in hearing about it. But I think it's pretty well known that I was challenged in the autumn of 1926, both on the subject of evolution and of the Sabbath day. My wife began to keep the Sabbath. To me, that was religious fanaticism. I had lost interest in church and religion since I had been 18 years of age. I was interested in business. And when I was challenged, I began to study evolution first. Now, it was quite convincing, many of the arguments, but there were a few little missing links that changed the whole complexion when I discovered them. Ultimately, I proved evolution is a false theory. I can absolutely, completely disprove evolution, and I have done it. And I have caused, died in the world evolutionists to admit that I proved it. But they say, well, but they have to go on accepting it and believing it anyway because they, they've, they've just been wedded to it for so long they wouldn't know how to live without believing in evolution. Well, that's the atheist's explanation of the presence of a creation without the supreme mind of a creator to have designed and thought out everything and brought it into being by a creation through a creator. So I began to wonder. I said, I, I always supposed that there is a God. I've been taught that ever since I was, was able to know anything as I was taken to church from the time I was born. Now, maybe I'd been misled. Maybe they were right. Maybe there is no God. I said, I've got to have proof. Why do you believe there's a God? So many of you, brethren, have not really seen the proof. You've heard it and heard it and taken it for granted. There are a lot of people in the world that say, oh, I believe in God all right. Now, they don't believe God. He's no part of their lives. But they say, well, I believe there is a God. I believe God exists. That's what they mean. Well, they've never proved it. They've just heard it and, and taken it for granted. I couldn't take it for granted any longer. I had to know. And I was studying day and night and often up to one or two o'clock in the morning till my wife would call out and say, are you ever coming to bed? You need to get some sleep. And I would be up early enough in the morning to get down to the library in Portland, Oregon by 9 o'clock when it opened and begin another day's study. And I proved the existence of God. And then I wanted to go further. Could I believe the Bible? I was going to go into the Koran and into the religious writings of other religions, but I said, I'll take the Bible first because it's the book out of which the Christian religion comes, and that's the religion of this country. 
Well, at first I thought the religion of Christianity came out of the Bible, but in my study I found that it doesn't. They try to read it into the Bible. But they're teaching precisely the opposite, the very antithesis of what the Bible says on most important things. They don't know what the gospel is. They don't know what salvation is. They don't know how you get it. They don't know what man is or why he is. They don't know who and what God is. No religion on earth knows. That's why I decided to write this book, The Mystery of the Ages. Who and what is God? Can you prove he exists? Why is it that people say, well, God isn't real to me? God just doesn't seem real. I've heard people say that. While we try to make it real, as real as I can in writing, in the book. There are many nations over in the east, in the far east, that believe in evil spirits and various kinds of spirit gods and spirit worship. And people from thousands of years have believed things like that. Well, what about, are there, are there spirits? Are there angels? Why? What are they? Why are they? Did God create a devil? That's a mystery. This book had to explain all that. Then man. You see, I was thinking in the summer of 1926, before this challenge came, I remember it so absolutely uh, vividly, just as if it was only yesterday. I was trying to reason out. I suppose I was an immortal soul at that time. And I was trying to reason out if I'm an immortal soul, now what will happen to me when I die? And just who and what am I? And, you know, it got the more I thought, and I tried to philosophize my way around it and tried to an come to an answer, but it was a mystery. I couldn't understand it. But in the study that began that autumn in 1926, I finally found out what a man is, a human being. The mystery of man. That's chapter 3 in the book. And then the civilization that has come from man. How did it develop? A civilization that now in the 20th century has produced awesome results going to the moon and back, the automobile, all the farm implements, most of all have been invented either in the last part of the last 19th century or in this century, many in this century. Phenomenal progress, and yet people can't solve their own problems. Troubles are escalating. Problems seem unsolvable by human beings. Great minds that can produce great technological advances still cannot solve their problems in their own homes or with their next-door neighbor. We can't solve political problems. We can't solve economic and industrial problems, capital and labor, problems between nations, wars, everything wrong. How did this civilization develop? That's a mystery. Ancient Israel, why, why should there be a chosen people? Did God discriminate? Then why the church? Why is there a church? Why, what is a church? Why is it? Is there any reason for it? Does it have a purpose? And what is it? The world doesn't know. The ministers of the churches don't know. And the whole message that God sent by Jesus Christ his gospel was the kingdom of God. And they don't know that, and the ministers don't preach it today. They preach a gospel about the person, 
about the messenger, but the message that he brought, they say nothing about. That finally comes to be chapter 7. And when we get through with that, that's only still the beginning. But in that study, I had proved the existence of God. Then I had absolutely proved to my own satisfaction. Absolutely proved the authority of the Bible, that it is definitely the word of God, the creator God, that it is 100% true in its original writings. Of course, we have translations, and a few errors might have crept in here and there, but there's so many translations and there have been so many copies that we can get to the exact truth if we just have a little bit of patience and are willing to study a little bit. We don't need to be in doubt about any point. Now, in that study, finally, of course, I had proved that God exists. I had disposed of evolution, but I hadn't yet disposed of this Sabbath question. And I was reading everything that the Methodists and other people had for Sunday and against the Sabbath. Of course, I was reading what Seventh-day Adventists had and what the Sardis era of the Church of God had about the Sabbath, but I wasn't believing what they said necessarily. I was only using that as a guide to what was in the Bible and to see whether they had that correct, but the main point was what does the Bible say? And I had finally come to the place where I was just about to accept the Sabbath, and that meant any crow to me because uh, in a dispute as intense as this was, a man doesn't like to admit that his wife was right and he was wrong. But I was just about to accept it, and then I came across a booklet written by a dissenter from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, they have had dissent dissenters from their church just the same as we have. And here was a dissenter who had written something to try to prove that the Adventists were wrong about the Sabbath. And he had, in this book, had gone through all of the passages in the Bible where the Sabbath, the monthly new moons, and the annual holy days were mentioned. And they're mentioned many times, all three of those mentioned together. And then he came to Colossians 2, verses 14 and 16, and he said, don't you see, there they are, and they're from the Old Testament, and that does away with the Sabbath. And I told my wife, I said, well, I was just about to accept the Sabbath, but I said, this knocks it all in the head. This is the former Seventh-day Adventist. And this shows that those days are done away, and it includes the weekly Sabbath as well. It says these holy days and new moons are all done away, and that means the Sabbath is done away with it. And my wife was worried sick. And... When I told her that, she didn't sleep that night. She prayed all night long. And in the morning, by the time I awakened in the morning, she told me to go back to the library. And she said, I want to ask you one thing. I want you to do this before you make a final decision. I want you to go through Colossians 2 and verse 16 and look up every single word in the original Greek language and get the meaning. And you will see, she says, God has shown me through the night, and I know that there is a word there that has been mistranslated, and when you get that straightened out, it does not do away with the day. Well, I 
I, I can't believe that, but I'll, I'll certainly go down and, and look up these words in the original Greek language. So I got a Greek text, and I took the words one by one, and I looked up each Greek word in the lexicon, which gives the definition in the English language of each Greek word. And I finally came to a word, respect. Now, I, I want to take time to show you what it was, so I've asked Aaron Dean to come out and read a text. I can't bring a Bible and read it to you. And Aaron, yes, sir. over there, will you read Colossians 2.14 first? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to, the, to his cross. A handwriting of ordinances, now nailing it to the cross. The idea was that all this is nailed to the cross, and that meant that the Sabbath was nailed to the cross in the holy days. Now it said in that verse, handwriting of ordinances. Though I thought it meant this, the, what Moses had, and that included the Sabbath and everything. Now verse 16, if you will read it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Now, I get an echo over here. I didn't hear every word of it, but I know it pretty well by heart. It talks about in respect of a holy new... Uh, uh, see, what is the Sabbath, the holy day, new moon? Holy day, new moon, and then Sabbath. Oh, the holy day, the new moon, and the Sabbath. Now, I had already read this, and you see, that was what got me. Because verse 14 talked about nailing to the cross. And in verse 16, there was the holy day, the new moon, and the Sabbath day. And I said, that does away with the Sabbath. I said, we know... I said, even the Adventists admit that the annual holy days are done away with. They don't observe these annual Sabbaths. So I went to the library, and I came to the word respect. I looked up every word in Colossians 2.16. And I saw that the word for respect, the original Greek word is M-E-R-E-I. And it means uh, part, parcel, portion, or observance of. And I look further into commentaries, and I, I looked up in the different lexicons, and one lexicon said that one definition of M-E-R-E-I is sacrificial meat observance. Sacrificial meat observance. Now I went back and looked it over and I said, well, that's what's done away. That's what is nailed to the cross. In every one of the texts wherever, the annual holy days, the week, uh, the monthly new moons, the weekly Sabbath are mentioned together. Every place in the Bible there were animal sacrifices held on those days. There was an animal sacrifice every Sabbath and every new moon. And every time that you could possibly mention, there were animal sacrifices and separate from the things that happened daily otherwise. Then I began to see that what was done away was the observances. Now I began to see from a further study of Colossians and of Romans, or not Colossians, but rather of uh, uh, Romans and, uh, and uh, Galatians, that the works of the law meant the rituals of the law. And it was not talking about the Ten Commandments, a spiritual law, but a physical law. And I found out 
that God had added besides statutes and judgments. Now, statutes and judgments were the national law of the land. Now, we have a national law of the land in the United States. That's the Constitution of the United States. We have many national laws that are made by Congress in Washington. We have state laws made by the state legislature up in Sacramento. Then we have ordinances made by the city council, and we have even county laws, and so on. But the laws that regulated one person's relationship to another person within the nation were the statutes and judgments. But God added another code of law to ancient Israel, and that was the, often they are called rituals. In other words, they were physical things to do, morning, noon, and night, every day. And they included special animal sacrifices every Sabbath, every new moon, and every annual holy day, or annual Sabbath, high day Sabbath, the Jews will call it still today, a high day. And so I saw that what was nailed to the cross was the physical ordinances. They had been a substitute for the Holy Spirit. God had closed up the tree of life in the days of Adam and Eve. And the tree of life had been closed up until Christ would come to sit on the throne and do away with Satan. And he hasn't done that yet. The tree of life is closed off from the world and still is today. And today, there are some called out of the world for some special purpose, and that's the church. But Jesus said, no man can come to me in the church except the Father which sent me draws him. In other words, those coming into the church are the called out ones, and God the Father calls them out, draws them to him. And the world does not understand that. The new book I'm writing will make every bit of this so plain, so clear. Now, it's going to take you a long time to read it. It'll be over 400 pages. You're not going to read this book at one setting. You're not going to read it in any one day. And by all means, when you get a copy of this book, I want you, after you've read it, to go back and read it again. Because there are many things that you're going to forget that you read in chapters 1, 2, or 3 by the time you get to chapter 6 or 7. And with that in your mind, you go back and read it all over, and it'll all make sense. And if you don't do that, you're likely to still be mixed up. There's nothing essentially new in this new book. Let me explain that. But the Bible is like a jigsaw puzzle. Like it's cut up into a few thousand pieces, each one in a different form and shape, little curly cues and, and ob, some oblongs, triangles and squares, rectangles but in different forms and shapes, and there's only one way that one piece will go with certain other pieces. They'll go together no other way, and when you get them together, it forms a beautiful picture, a jigsaw puzzle. That's the way the Bible is. It's in different parts here and there, any one subject. You study the Sabbath, you find some of it in the second chapter of Genesis, and you find some of it clear back in Revelation clear to the end of Revelation. You'll find it all the way through, a little here, a little there. So the Bible itself tells you in the book of Isaiah that God has made it a coded book, and it is here a little, there a little. Well, the book I'm writing is trying to take all those pieces and put them together in a time sequence and still, it's only a synopsis. In other words, I'm covering the, the root, the trunk of the tree, and the major branches. But the little minor branches and the 
twigs are not trying to fill in. It is a sort of, oh, what is the word I want to think of? Uh, well, it's a summary, anyway. And, but it explains it so you can begin to understand the Bible. And it is the Bible made plain. That's, that's what it will be. Aaron Dean and I have been working very hard on this. And since I can't see to read anything anymore, he has to sit there and read to me. I start to type on the typewriter, and every time I stop, he has to come and read what I wrote and, and set the typewriter for the next word. And I hit the wrong key quite often, but he is able to figure out where I hit the wrong key and correct it. And that's the way we get things done. But, you know, if you read the booklet on the seven laws of success, you'll find that one of the laws is... Having the, uh, oh no, what's the word I want? You not only have to have education and drive, but you, you, uh, you have to have the, uh, someone will have to tell me the word I guess, it won't come to me. The ingenuity to think your way through it anyway. And then you have to stick with it and never give up. Well, I tried to practice that, and the job is still getting done. There is always a way. I, I find now we're serving handicapped people over in Jordan, and I can really suffer to an extent with them and appreciate them because I find I have quite a handicap now. And I find that you can go ahead and get things done in spite of a handicap. That's that's the thing a lot of people have learned, and I suppose some people have not learned it. Now, how did this all start? How did sin start? It started in the Garden of Eden. God had one man created... Now that man, as far as he went, was perfect. God saw whatever he had created, and it was not just good, it was very good. Very good. But he hadn't finished it yet. Now I've said so many times, there's so much duality in the Bible, and in this book you'll find the duality is mentioned Dozens of times, all the way through. There's so much duality. The first and the second. The first is usually physical, the second is spiritual. The old and the new covenant. The first Adam and the second Adam. Now Adam was in, made in sort of a dual process. First God made the man. God's purpose was to reproduce himself. But he started out with a physical man made from the dust of the ground. Now the man, as far as he went, was made very good. You could call it perfect. Physically, he was absolutely perfect. There was nothing wrong with him. As long as he observed nature's laws, he wouldn't be sick. But he was not complete yet. His Creation had not been quite completed. God wanted him to reproduce, and he couldn't do it. So God had to complete him by putting him into a deep sleep. That's exactly what they do when they operate on you in the hospital. We call it anesthesia. And then God operated on him, and God took out one of his ribs. Now, you know, there's a little point there that may interest some of you. A lot of people say, well, if God did that, why well, come we all don't come short of one rib? Well, you know, acquired characteristics are not carried on by heredity. A man can have 
a, a leg amputated, a finger amputated, or a toe. That doesn't mean when he has children that they will have it amputated or gone and be born without one. So Adam's children had the full number of ribs when they were born. But he made a woman out of one of Adam's ribs. The woman wasn't made from the dust of the ground. She was made from the man. Now, right now, one of the things, uh, one of the evils that are coming along, God made the man to rule over the woman, but it, to, it was the kind of ruling in love. God is a ruler, but God is love. His mercy is as great toward us as the heavens are high above the earth. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, if we repent, and because he paid the penalty in our stead through Christ. That's the way a man should rule over his wife. It is a loving supervision. Loving her as himself. Sometimes a man loves his wife more than himself and does things for her that he shouldn't. That are not good for her. A lot of men love to please their wives. And still they neglect the right kind of leadership over them. This rule is merely leadership. Loving leadership. That's what it is. And so man was finally physically complete, but not mentally. He still just had one spirit with a brain. And that gave him human mind. With perhaps several million times greater output than an animal brain, and yet the brain is the same. And the animal brain is just as good. The difference is there's a spirit in man. But man is not a spiritual being. On the television this morning, I heard a man say that I was watching my program this morning on television, and there was another program following, and I won't mention the man's name. He will mention mine, and he says, I don't have any cred credibility. I don't think he has any either. But I don't have to mention his name. Anyhow, he was saying that God formed man of the dust of the ground and he became a spiritual being. That is not so. The Bible doesn't say that. A spiritual being, a spirit, has become a spirit and can't die. And God said to this soul, you shall surely die if you take the forbidden tree. And the soul and the sin of it shall die. And so the soul is not spiritual. Anyway, then God created the woman. And how did sin start? Well, Satan slipped in. Now, as to whether Eve had stolen away from Adam and Satan got to her alone, or whether Satan got to her while she was right there in Adam's presence, frankly, the Bible doesn't state. It does say that when Eve was tempted and deceived, that she took of the fruit and did eat and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, at that time, the husband was there with her. And was he with her at the time Satan tempted her? The Bible just doesn't say one way or the other. I've always assumed she'd stolen away from him, and he should have been looking after her. Now, perhaps so. And if so, she came back to take it, and her husband was with her when she took the, the, fr the fruit, but might not have been with her when the devil tempted her. I don't know. I only know what God says. When I tell you these things, I'm only telling you what God reveals. You can check up on it. It's all in the Bible, and you can see it the same as I can. 
I'm not giving you things that I made up in my mind. I didn't originate the truths that I teach. But I learned them the same way the Apostle Paul did, directly from Jesus Christ. But you see, Jesus Christ in person was on earth and taught Paul. And, but Jesus, the Bible is Jesus Christ in writing. It's the same word exactly. And Jesus Christ in person was the word of God. And the Bible in print is the word of God. And they're both the same. I just learned it from the printed word, and he learned from the verbal word, and, and, and from Jesus in person who spoke to him. But the word was the same, precisely the same. Now, they disobeyed God. They sinned. And when they did, God closed the tree of life. And it was closed until the second Adam would come and remove Satan from the throne and sit on that throne. As long as Adam had obeyed Satan, Adam and his family were to be Satan's kidnapped children. And this world is being held hostage. And Jesus came to pay the ransom price for the kidnapping when he paid for our sins. And so all through time up till now, the tree of life has remained closed. That's why the world can't understand. And again in Ephesians 4, the first few verses up to verse 4, you will read how Satan has deceived the world and blinded them. And blinded them so they can't see spiritually. They can't see the truth. Now, when Jesus came, he was the second Adam. But he did not come to sit on that throne. Jesus came, now I want you to get this, because I haven't put it quite this way before. Jesus came first to qualify to sit on that throne where the first Adam failed. The first Adam could have qualified to sit on that throne and be placed Satan, but he failed. Jesus came and he had to meet Satan head on. And he conquered Satan. Satan tried to conquer him. That was the most titanic battle ever fought. No great war involving millions of people. And shedding of much human blood has ever been as titanic a battle as the one that Jesus fought when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted of the devil. And the three very great temptations, both physical and spiritual. You read of it in the fourth chapter of Matthew, the first verses. Jesus had to come. He couldn't just come and sit on the throne. He had to come and qualify. Now, he didn't have to be taught how to do it. He already knew that. But he came to call others out of this world to join him in sitting on that throne when he was going to sit on the throne. He didn't come to save the world. He made no effort to save the world. Not once can you find him begging people to give their hearts to him. Not once did he promise them the Holy Spirit if they would only accept him and receive him. Not once, not once did he go out or did he send anyone out on a soul-saving crusade. On the contrary, he was walking up through Samaria and he came to Jacob's well and there was a woman, a Gentile woman. And he mentioned, he asked her to give him some water, draw a little water out of the well, he was thirsty. And he said, she wondered who he was. She said, how, 
how come you, a Jew, would ask me a, uh, oh, they were uh, Samaritans, and the Jews would call them dogs and would have nothing to do with them, and it was surprising that he would even talk to her because Jews would not. And she asked him, how come? And he answered her, if you knew who would ask you for that cup of water, you would ask him to give you living waters, and he could give you living waters, and you would never thirst. Well, right away, she did ask him. She said, well, give me of this living water. The living water, he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what a wonderful chance for him to say, boy, 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 daughter, if you confess me now, you can have the Holy Spirit. You go to heaven when you die. He didn't say anything of the kind. You know what he said to her? He told her about her sins. He said, go call your husband. Well, she looked a little strange at that. Well, uh, uh, she, she said, I, I, I have no husband. Well, Jesus said, in effect, for once you told the truth, as if she never been accustomed to telling the truth. Now, you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Well, she wondered, how did he know all that about me? He never saw me before. No, he wasn't on a soul-saving crusade. He said, no one can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him. Now, why? Why is the church the first fruits? Brethren, today we're ending the first festival, the spring festival. And we begin to look now toward 50 days from last Sunday. And we come to the time of the day of Pentecost. Or the feast of first fruits, picturing the church as the first fruits of God's salvation. Why are we the first fruits? Is God discriminating against the rest of the world when He calls us out and says others can't come to Him? We have been predestinated to come to Christ. You have been predestinated. If you have God's Holy Spirit, otherwise you wouldn't have God's Holy Spirit. But now, why are we the first fruits? Why is God not calling the rest of the world? Why are we being called to become teachers in the world tomorrow? We're going to be called kings and priests. As kings, we will rule. Jesus said to us in the church, not to anyone outside of the church, if you overcome, you will be given power over the nations to rule them with a rod of iron. Revelation 3, verse 21. He that overcometh, to him will I grant to sit with me in my throne when he sits on Satan's throne even as Jesus did overcome and is now set down with his Father on his Father's throne in God's heaven. We're called for a special reason. Now, why are we called now? Why? Is God discriminating against the rest of the world? Or is he discriminating against us? We have to fight Satan. And when they're, when God finally saves them, they won't have Satan to fight because he's not going to call and save them until Satan is put away. All right, let me tell you something you never thought of before. Now open your ears, please, and listen. Because here is a truth I think you haven't thought of. Jesus had to come and qualify by overcoming Satan before he could sit on that throne. We are going to sit with him on that throne. So we have to be called 
at a time when we qualify by also having to overcome Satan. He that overcometh, what do you overcome? Satan. And the world, Satan's world, and your own self that Satan has already inoculated his spirit and attitude into you. That's why we're the first fruit. We have to qualify during Satan's reign. The rest of the world will be called when Satan is not reigning any longer. Now, you never heard that before, brethren. God has called me as one to whom he can reveal his truth and through whom he has revealed the truths that you have. He revealed the truth to me. I started to tell you at the beginning of the service this afternoon how God called me back at the fall of 1926 and how I came to this about the Sabbath and Colossians 2.16. And when I saw that the days weren't being done away with, but that the sacrificial meat offerings on the days were done away with, and only the physical things, but not the spiritual things, then I said, then the days are not nailed to the cross, the days are not done away with. And I said to my wife, that means... You're not keeping enough of the Sabbath. You're only keeping the weekly Sabbaths, and we've got to keep the annual Sabbaths as well. And she was overjoyed. She could see it right away. Because now I could see the Sabbath, and I could see that it meant the annual Sabbaths as well. Rather, as far as I know, no one else on earth except those or those that got it from us, and that's very few, are observing God's annual Sabbaths. It just has not been done through these ages. God said someone was to come and restore the truths that had been lost, and they were lost mostly during the very first century of the church over 1,900 years ago. You know, there's a prophecy about John the Baptist. Well, the prophecy is about Elijah. But if you read in Elijah 3 and verses 1 to 5, it is talking not about someone preparing the way for Christ's first coming, but when Christ comes to sit on the throne of the earth and remove Satan. You read verse 1 and you can apply that to John the Baptist but you read on through verse 2, 3, 4, and 5 and you'll find it's talking about the second coming of Christ. The things that he will do then but he did none of those things that are in verses 2, 3, 4, and 5 when he came the first time. Now, John the Baptist did fulfill verse 1. Even Jesus said so. Jesus said that he had come in the power and spirit of Elijah. Was he Elijah? No, he wasn't. They asked John the Baptist, are you Elijah? He said, no, I am not. And he wasn't a liar. He knew the truth. He was not Elijah. Am I Elijah? No, definitely not. Now, (laughs) I've met Elijah. Elijah Elijah has come and announced to me that he was Elijah, but I showed him the way out of the office. I, I didn't believe him. I suppose there are a lot of Napoleons around and a lot of Elijahs. Even one came into one of our offices one time and said he was Jesus Christ. Well, he got thrown out. If he was Christ, he couldn't have been thrown out. Christ was a little too strong for that. 
So there are some crackpots around. But just because we have truth doesn't mean we're crackpots by any matter of means. Now in the 17th chapter of Matthew, you find the transfiguration when a couple of apostles were with Jesus and in the transfiguration they saw a vision and there was Christ as he will be in his second coming in glory and with him was Moses and Elijah and he said don't tell anyone until after uh, I think it was after his crucifixion but then the disciples asked him, well, how do, how do they say now that Elijah shall yet come? Now, at that time, John the Baptist had already come and had been taken prisoner, and his ministry was all finished, and undoubtedly he had already had his head taken off and was dead. And they asked Jesus, how, how do they say that Elijah shall first come before the day of the Lord and before Christ's second coming? And Jesus answered, truly, Elijah shall come and restore all things. What was he talking about, brethren? John the Baptist did not restore anything. He came and called those who already knew. He didn't restore knowledge to them. He called them to repentance and baptized them and a baptism of repentance. But he didn't teach them new knowledge. Jesus did that. Jesus is the one who came as a teacher. John the Baptist was a baptizer, not a teacher. But Jesus said, after John the Baptist had come and gone, that Elijah would yet come before the second coming of Christ and before the day of the Lord. Has anything been restored? The original truth that was lost has been restored to this church. Brethren, these are days when God's prophecies are being fulfilled and we don't have too much longer until even the second coming of Christ is going to occur. Now, every now and then I see that some crackpot gets something out saying that I have said I'm going to live until the second coming of Christ. I don't remember ever having said that. And I'll tell you, I have no reason whatsoever to believe that. Absolutely no reason in the world to believe it. I will just say this. I'll live as long as Jesus Christ and God the Father want me to live. My life belongs to them. It's not mine. As long as he wants to keep me here, I will be here. And if I die, it's because he's going to let me die. And that may be before tomorrow morning. I don't know. I absolutely don't know. For your sakes, I want to stay on. I feel a lot like the Apostle Paul did when he said he would like to go and be with Christ, but it was needful for them that he stay on longer. It's the same way now. So I'll try to take care of myself so that I can stay on as long as God wants me to. I will try to continue to lead you in the truth. But there are those who would love to destroy that truth. We are the first fruits. Now think of why. We're going to come to that holy day next. It'll be only 50, less than 50 days now. 50 days from last Sunday. That is the feast of first fruits, and we have to come to realize that we are called as the first fruits because we are called to have to qualify to sit on that throne the same as Jesus did. Now we'll be under him. 
but we will be made very God, the same as he is made God by a resurrection from the dead. If we die between now and then, we'll be resurrected immortal as God beings. If we're still alive, we'll be changed in the moment in the the twinkling of an eye and rise, not in an airplane, but just rise up in the air by yourself without wings and meet him in the clouds in the air and everybody will come down over the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem or just to the east of the main city of Jerusalem. That's why we go up in the air. God's going to get everybody over there in a hurry. And I think somehow you'll go faster than you would in an airplane. I don't know just how God's going to work that out. We wait and see. But we're living in the very last days. Sin is increasing by leaps and bounds. Sin is coming at you and being thrown at you in every way and from every direction as never before. Now we've had seven days to show us that we have to put sin out of our lives. We're called for a special mission. We are special with God. But that puts the responsibility on you to resist sin, to put sin out of your lives. and put the righteousness of God in, and to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. Brother, and I have come to see why I should hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. You see, every bit of pain and suffering, every bit of stress, mental torment of any kind, Every bit of everything that is unhappy and unpleasant comes from sin. If you are righteousness, that's the absence of sin. And sin is the absence of righteousness. But if you get rid of the sin and supplant it with God's righteousness, then you have none of those things to worry about. Now, I think about God. And God has no worries, no frustrations. God has full confidence and faith and full assurance. God is supremely happy. The only thing that can possibly make him unhappy is some of us and things that we do. But I'm, I think he's, he loves us so much he's willing to suffer that for us if necessary, and he does. But I do hunger and thirst for his righteousness because it means the absence of the consequences of sin. This world is trying to do away with the consequences of sin, and they can't do it. And they're not accomplishing it, and they never will. The consequences of sin are going to be there. We should come out of it all together. Now look forward to the next festival, the Feast of First Fruits. And remember, we're called and we're only starting now on getting sin out of our lives and growing in knowledge and in grace and overcoming constantly and enduring to the end. Well, God bless you and help every one of you and keep close to him.